is perfectly good to eat. It's solid, it still weighs probably 10 12 pounds. Is that a pumpkin or a squash? This is a sweet meat squash. Real Still hard. But you'll have to. Still completely edible. You're going to have to use a big knife to open this. Yeah, but the, the problem with that is how many families you can share that with. You can it or freeze it. You can can it or freeze it. What you don't use right away. But the thing is, I picked Juice this it. nine months ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nine months ago? Yeah. So it's still good food. Yeah, I did. But how do you preserve it? Like, Stick around. You'll learn. <laughs> uh, this potato, it's still firm, it's still good. I pulled this out of my garden this morning. It's been sitting in the ground all winter. These carrots, these were planted last year. They're good at the carrots. Yeah, so we'll win. talk, we won't necessarily talk about the preserving, but we will talk about... Did you winter over those carrots? We did. Yeah. In the ground. Uh -huh. yeah. We wintered potatoes, you can see it's starting to sprout. In our cold frame. Um, but potatoes are still good. You don't have to harvest things. In this, you, in this in plant. Yeah. You just got to keep the critters so, out. Once your potatoes get too wet, you have an outdoor garden that's got all the three. You know, the funny thing, is, this is, okay, I'm glad you brought this in. This is so brilliant of mankind. Mulch. Without us, how does anything live out there? <laughs> What happens in nature? Does God take up all these potatoes, put them in a root cellar for the winter where they grow naturally? No. So why do we do it? I'm not trying to embarrass you, but you know what I'm saying? Is it struck me one day, it's like, okay, so why do I have to go through all of our big things up? Why can't I just leave them there? And in January, February, or December, go out, slog through the mud, and dig up my parsnips, or potatoes. They're out there, just sitting like this, Waiting for spring. You can always cover them and mulch them. Uh, yeah, go I tilled my garden two days ago. Uh huh. And I had carrots and potatoes out there last year. And sure enough, I found them. They're there. Yeah. Oh. Still good food. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the potatoes, like, that's beautiful. It was, uh, yeah. Just white on the inside. You know, there are going to be problems sometimes. Uh, the potatoes can rot. But, but that's the way God created them to sit in the dorm cold dam. Because the plants have died. They're not growing anymore. There's a story about Ellen White, you know, when they hired a farmer to come over and plow a field. And
about 25%-ish air capacity inside that soil. Uh, it's got to have a, a water capacity of about 25-ish percent. And it's got to have about 3 to 5% organic matter. And what we want to see in that soil is a whole world of microorganisms living in that soil um, in, in balance. And that's going to produce a perfect environment for plants to grow in. But, but oftentimes we get just caught up with the plant part of it, especially the top part of the plant, and we kind of forget what's happening down in the soil. A, a newly created soil uh, profile, let's say, um, we go out into the plains of Nebraska or wherever, um, it's just grassland, or we come out here in the woods, cut the trees down, we pull the stumps out, and we're going to create a new soil profile. So we start putting organic matter in there, we start adding nutrients. One of the first things that happens in that soil is uh, you have an, an explosion of, of uh, bacteria. So bacteria is one of the first organisms to really explode in the soil. The bacteria is, is what is primarily responsible for decaying the organic matter, breaking it down so it's usable. But over the long haul, what replaces the bacteria is the fungi. A soil that is mature, <clears throat> stable, and healthy is a fungal soil. These are funguses that are good for the soil, good for the plants. But it kind of goes through this transition from a disrupted uh, soil where the bacteria is predominantly uh, the mechanism of, of conditioning that soil or creating the profile. And then it moves to more of that stable, um, mature, fungal dominated. There's still bacteria, there's still fungal in both situations, but uh, what a more stable soil like, like the soil is sitting out there. Uh, if we were to go out there, I don't know that we necessarily have time, but maybe after we're done, if we go out there under that canopy where the soil really hasn't been disturbed, uh, the first thing you're going to see is just debris on top, this, on top of the soil. And if we just gently take away the debris, that is identifiable sticks and leaves, all that, we pull that away, what we find underneath of that is sticks and debris, but you can tell it's obviously decaying. In the process of decaying, it's still identifiable. When we, when we carefully peel back that layer, what we find underneath is material that has been so decayed you can't identify it. It's just this crumbly, rich, fluffy stuff. And you keep digging, you dig past that. And now you're starting to realize, okay, now we're getting into actual dirt. And, and the dirt has had leached into it all of this debris that's filtered down into the dirt. So it's fairly dark dirt. But as we keep digging, we'll start getting into lighter colored dirt usually that you can tell is pretty much 100% dirt. So it goes from this transition as you go down from undecayed branches of material that is falling right now, that's coming down on the top, and then over time it's transitioning down into a really nice topsoil. Mix. And that's pretty much where all of the life is, <clears throat> is in the soil. So in our garden, most of our plants, the roots are within the top 8, 10 inches of our soil. Uh, that's where all the microorganisms are, that's where the, the minerals are exchanging, all the chemistry is taking place. Well then you ask, so why do roots tree roots or other big plant, why do their roots go down 10 feet, 12 feet? What's down there that they're getting? Water. Water. 
they're mining water, and they're mining nutrients, mineral nutrients. Um, there's no oxygen down there, so there's no anaerobic, or, you know, this air breathing biology is happening. You get that far down in the ground, there's just no air. So everything that happens down there is what we call aerobic uh, chemistry. Uh, anaerobic, excuse me, anaerobic, without air. Um, there are bacteria that live down there, um, but it's a completely different type of, of chemistry going. But predominantly, the, the top foot, or even six inches of soil, is, that's, that's where all the magic is really happening. Uh, so, if you kind of break down, when we look at some of the chemistry, and I know this is like, chemistry. A plant needs approximately 17, where did my go? Uh, 17 elements to really thrive. We, on the other hand, need these 17 elements plus about another 13 or 14 for us to really thrive. So where are we going to get the other elements? Well, hopefully from the plants, which are getting from the soil. Uh, the problem is, our Earth is so imbalanced now in how it's composed, especially after the flood, that uh, what we get out of the ground is not always completely sustaining our biology, our health. And so what happens? We get old and we decay. Um, and this is kind of another layer we throw onto that question that I put out is why do we grow a garden? Well, ultimately, if you're really interested in health and really want to explore um, your own body's chemistry, you'll make sure this is not only in your soil, but almost all of the periodic chart is going to be put in your soil so that your plant not only has this, but it has the minerals and the nutrients that your body needs. The plant doesn't necessarily need it, but it will pick it up, and then we're going to eat that plant, and we're going to get all the elements in the periodic chart that our body needs. And then some neat things can happen. Uh, starting at the top here, the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen, the plants are basically getting those as established uh, minerals in the soil. The carbon is coming from the air, uh, as well as the soil, from organic material. But the carbon, the plant is mostly getting its carbon from carbon dioxide in the air. Same with the hydrogen and the oxygen from the, the atmosphere as well. Although oxygen is also bound up in the minerals, um, in the soil. You get uh, quartz, for instance, is uh, quartz. Silic uh, yeah. Silicon dioxide, it's a, uh, a lot of the minerals are bound up with, with oxygen. <coughs> may not necessarily be as available as the oxygen in the air, but the plants are getting carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from here, from the environmental. The primary nutrients that a plant needs is the nitrogen, the potassium, and the prime nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the big three. Sometimes we tend to focus too much on those three. Um, the, uh, the secondary elements are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. The plant has to those, and the most important one of those is the calcium. Having these nutrients, having these elements, <clears throat> affect each other in that, for instance, without boron, this micronutrient here, a trace element, um, without boron in the picture, the plant loses, to some degree, the capacity to pick up that calcium. So not only do plants need these elements, but they need the other elements because it's all like a gigantic web that's interacting with each other. And that goes back to the idea of why we want to create a perfect soil that is, that is all working. And you, as a matter of fact, we have the same situation happening in our gut. Um, if, if you look at, at the, 
content of your gut, the microbiome, is it's like an entire world of its own in, in flora and fauna that lives inside of you, right? And matter of fact, there's actually more bacteria and these different living organisms that are living in you than you have cells in your own body. So there's more of them than there are of you. <laughs> but if we if we down a whole bunch of antibiotics and we kill that that whole flora and fauna, what happens to us? We get sick. We eat food. What what happens to the food? It can't do its job. Doesn't digest very well, does it? Mm -hmm. And and we get all these crazy health problems. And so we have to reestablish that that mature gut biome in order to function well at all. And so, in a way, the soil is the plant's stomach. And if things are all disrupted down there in the ground, then it's going to be demonstrated in the plant through disease. Uh, the plant might look good, but it might be completely nutritionally deficient. Yeah. So what you're saying then, in essence, is if the soil the value of the soil, the profile of it is correct, there's less potential for even pests and other things to want to attack it. Yeah. You develop Because it only, it, and most bugs and stuff only attack weak stuff. They don't attack yeah. the strong stuff. And there's, a very, there's an interesting uh, video out there. If you look it up on YouTube, it's called What Plants Talk About. It's kind of cool. What plants talk about? And it, it, it brings up some amazing uh, research that's being done on plants do communicate with their surroundings. And it's on a chemical level. But it's amazing that when a plant gets stressed, it, it chemically screams. It puts out these, ah! And yeah, they, they, the pests that are out there recognize a helpless victim. And it's like, we're going to go for the one that's screaming because it's defenseless. <clears throat> so yes, a very interesting concept there. <clears throat> what we're learning, how, how plants communicate with their neighbors. And they have an effect on the ones around them. So, uh, so having these minerals. Uh, matter of fact, let me back up. Back then, I think it was the 30s, I can't remember the fellow's name, but a, a chemist, soil chemistry guy, agriculture guy, he started noticing something, and that is, in a pasture of cows, the cows tended to eat more from a particular part of that pasture. It's like, why do they do that? The grass is all the same, it's all green. It all looks good. But what they found, what he found as he started analyzing the plants, the nutrient content of the plants in a particular part of the field was way higher than the same exact plants, the grass, in all the rest of the field. So then he started doing soil research and found out the, the chemistry of the soil, a lot more calcium, and that was kind of the, the flick to the dominoes, was the calcium. And the calcium got like everything else going and working in that spot, which released more nutrient to the plant, even though they all look the same. And the cows can taste the difference. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it is incredibly amazing. So there's, there's an enormous amount of education that we can explore into in soil chemistry. Feed and, and create the soil, I and mean, then whatever you plant in it is going to naturally just thrive. But we want to kind of talk a little bit about this uh, nutrient stuff. Uh, trace elements are boron, copper, iron, zinc, molybdenum, chlorine, nickel, and coal are the ones that plants really need. There's a product out there. It's called C90. It's kind of like sea salt. Matter of fact, that's where they get it from. Uh, evaporated sea salt, and it has not only these trace elements in it, but it has almost the whole periodic chart of elements in it. It's, kind of, it's a salt product, and you put it very lightly 
um, on your garden, and it puts those all those uh, elements back into the soil. But, yeah. Where would I get that? Look online. Would they, Where they, you ask me to remind you of a place, concentrate, do they have it? I don't know if they have it. Okay. Um, there is a place in Milwaukee, it's called Concentrate. They have an enormous amount of various soil amendments. Uh, uh, um, what was I going to say? Standard amendments, standard fertilizers, but they also have a whole bunch of organic type stuff, more natural products. Do you say Milwaukee? But it's, it's in Milwaukee, it's called Concentrates. You can look it up. And, um, they're just a really nice supplier. They've also got crop, uh, uh, cover crops. You can buy seed, clover, and rye, and vetch. Um, but you can buy big bags of amendments, soil amendments, and work on developing your soil. <clears throat> as far as the profile, really heavy clay soil is going to be missing the airspace. Right? And without airspace, you're going to lose water capacity. So they all affect each other. Here in this area, our part of the Pacific Northwest, the valley floor, like where we're at now, tends to be a nice sandy, loamy soil. But the moment you go up on the hills, it becomes red clay. And if you've been out on the... In, in, when, the red clay, where we live especially, when that's been tilled and you walk in it, it, it it's thick and it's gooey and it sticks to your shoes. And, and what's happening is, where's that? Magnesium. It's the magnesium in the red clay that makes it glue-like and sticky. So, we need magnesium, it's a secondary element, it's very important to have, but when there's way more magnesium in a ratio between magnesium and calcium, the soil becomes sticky and gooey. So when you see that kind of soil in your garden, it means so the soil wants more of this, wants more calcium. So we're, uh, we're going to talk about uh, soil testing in a minute, but if you really want to get like precise and particular about this, there are formulas out there to determine how much calcium your particular soil is going to need. When you put the calcium in there, it's going to interact with the soil, with the magnesium, and it's going to take that clay and make it more friable, more loose, and, and nice. Yeah. Are there plants that you can put in the soil that will help break up that clay? Uh, there's some. Um, I have a friend that said he used uh, buckwheat, yeah. and he found that that was very, very good. He said tilling along the where he planted the buckwheat yeah. is the road till it's on. Part of part of what's happening. There's a couple of things going on there. There's a little bit of chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use like alfalfa. There's really deep rooted plants mm -hmm. who will tend to make channels through the soil, and then when the alfalfa is killed that will decay out and leave poor porosity in the soil. The other thing is, the buckwheat is adding organic matter to the soil, which also helps to break it up some. Right. So there's kind of a mechanical mechanism, a chemical mechanism, but as far as solving the chemistry balance, mm -hmm. it's not doing that so much Good. as as we we want to address it on the chemical level by adding the calcium. And there's several ways of doing that. Um, let's go on. Uh, talking about soil texture, there's typically, uh, we, how we class uh, soils, there's basically three kinds of soils. The real big particles of soil, we call sand. As you start getting smaller, it starts getting into the uh, the silt, or what we'll call the loam soil. And then as the soil particles get smaller and smaller, like very, very tiny, it becomes more colloidal, more clay-like. And down here, uh, one is 
neighbors, uh, the neighbors, uh, Ron and Ruth Davis, that since moved away, Ron was an avid gardener, and it would just drive me crazy because down here on the valley floor, you just got this really nice riverbed, sandy, loamy soil. He could go out there and he could rototill it two hours after the heaviest Pacific Northwest rain, and it would just till up all nice and fluffy, and he could plant it. <laughs> and I would be up on the mountain, and oftentimes up on the hill, just a few miles away, I can't rototill until mid June. When, when it has stopped raining for at least two weeks and my soil, my heavy clay soil, is finally dry enough that I can till it without tilling it into bricks. Because if, if I till my soil just a day or two too early and it's got too much water in it, it just tills it into the clods like this that when the sunshine hits it, it just turns it into bricks. And you just can't till it enough afterwards to get it down to a nice soil. And so, so one of the things that I need to do more of is, is do my tests, see how much uh, calcium I can get back into that soil and start breaking that up. The other thing I can do is add the organic matter, which is also going to break that up. Um, so so the, the sand, the silt, the clay, we we see nasty things about clay soil, but it is actually clay soil that has the greater capacity for nutrient content. So, you know, it's like not everything is pure good and the other is just pure bad. You gotta have a good blend. Mm -hmm. um, it's nice to have the nice loamy soil, but it's also nice to have some clay in there too. Because sand just does not hold much nutrient. It's, it's really nice to work and fun to play with, but it's actually a little bit hard, or maybe just as hard, to take pure sand and create a really good soil biome profile in that, as it does on the other extreme, taking solid clay, blue clay, red clay, and, and working that over time to make that a beautiful soil profile, too. Uh, the, the lonely kind of river bottom, um, nutrient-rich soil, it's, it's kind of the perfect one. It's easiest to work with. But uh, putting the organic matter into the soil is what the bacteria and the fungus are going to feed on. Um, it's what you eat that feeds the microbiome in your stomach and it makes that to thrive. If you eat the right kind of foods, it really enhances your microbiome, right? And then you go to Taiwan and you eat something completely different that you're not used to eating at all. What happens down here? Yeah. Not <laughs> <at all. laughs> you don't have the microorganisms to deal with that new, brand new, crazy, wild thing. And so your stomach doesn't know what to do with it. So it kind of goes in the fits. Well, it's kind of the same thing with the soil. But uh, feed in organic matters feeds those microorganisms in the soil. It also, this organic matter also creates the air space that, that, that allows the, the air and the water to change places and to be in that soil as well. Uh, the organic matter also buffers uh, the pH of the soil, the acidity or the basicity of the soil. In the Pacific Northwest here, because we have so much rain, our soils tend to be more acidic. If you go over the mountain, over into Yakima, and over on the eastern side, there's a lot less rain over there. And uh, um, with the, the rainfall, it's a lot less over in eastern Washington, what you'll find is there's a way, way more amount of calcium, especially calcium and magnesium, in the soils. We used to live in the Tri-Cities, and there would just be so much calcium and magnesium in the soil that the sprinklers, <coughs> if they hit your car or they hit your, your house windows, and the water would evaporate, it would make the window completely white. And you couldn't even see through it. 
so much calcium and magnesium in that water. It was good for the soil, but it was too much. In the soil, the calcium and magnesium would raise the pH of the soil, so now the soil is really basic. Um, which, when you get a, a, the soil too basic, up in the 8, 9 range, uh, there's a lot of things that just don't grow well. For instance, blueberries. Blueberries are like acidic soil. And when you add the organic matter, uh, you, you can acidify that soil. Yeah. It's interesting because having been over there in one of the areas over there, and the, when they water their trees, yeah. the fruit would end up with white stuff on it. Yeah. I used to wonder what that was, and now it makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's actually, when we lived, we lived over in tri cities for almost 10 years, and the interesting thing is having that high of calcium in your water, I was actually getting feed, uh, uh, cavities that were calcified, they were filling in. Huh. And the, the dentist looked at it, it's like, oh, your, your cavities are going away. <laughs> So, you know, there's some good and bad, I guess, in the whole thing. Um, the other thing that organic matter does is it, and I kind of already talked about this, it allows the porosity, the airspace, which then can exchange air versus water, and keep that balance uh, in check. But having organic matter also allows the soil on this side of it, the, the mineral makeup, it allows for an exchange of these minerals in and out of the soil. We call this cation exchange capacity. So in the soil chemistry, in these minerals, you've got positively charged ions like the calcium and magnesium, uh, the iron, the copper, boron, and you have some <coughs> negatively charged ions, the uh, the calcium, the uh, excuse me, the um, chlorine, and uh, some of the elements that are over on the right hand side of the periodic chart can form negatively charged particles. The predominant chemistry, though, is on the, the positively charged ions, and you want you want those ions, those those minerals that are in the soil. You don't want them like hammered down and riveted to the soil particles so that they're not doing anything. You want those, that chemistry to be soluble, to be in play for the, for the plant roots to be able to pick them up and then to take them in and be able to use them in the plant itself. So, so a lot depends on this little tiny slice of the pie we call organic matter. So we're putting that in there. And that's actually what's being done out there in the forest is you have this constant regeneration and input to the soil that creates that top topsoil layer that is so um, rich in nutrient and, and really is uh, creating a thriving environment for the plants that are picking up that nutrient. Uh, so, okay, I don't want to overdo the soil thing. But uh, a couple other things that I did want to bring up about the soil. Uh, a, this is just kind of a random thing, I just want to throw this in there. But if you, if you put out a container with straight sides in your boat, and you put a sprinkler on, and you sprinkle uh, an inch of water, so that container, an inch full of water tells you that there's also been an inch amount of water put on your garden. An inch of water will saturate, on average, six inches of soil dirt. So if, if you know that your plants, most of the roots are in the top six inches of your soil, an inch of water is going to be good, right? So, so when you put your sprinkler on, put a container out, and let it go, so you start getting an idea of your sprinkler, your spot, how much water are you putting on your garden. If you're putting three inches of water, well, you're wasting time. You're wasting water. 
and electricity to it, that water line. Um, if you let the, the sprinkler run for four hours and it's, it takes four hours to get you your end, well then you know, okay, I'll let the sprinkler run for four hours a week. I'm giving it an inch of water a week. Um, blueberries, that's about the recommendation for blueberries, is an inch of water a week. You don't have to do that all in one day, you know, a half inch one day, a half inch another day. Uh, but uh, getting an idea as to how much water you're putting on, uh, you can do that with a rain gauge or a container setting uh, out there in your garden. So you're not overdoing it or underdoing it. If you're just putting water out there that's just going down into the ground and uh, just leaching away, you know, then that's kind of counterproductive to what you're doing. Uh, we talked a little bit about calcium as a fairly big deal, because that's usually the element that's deficient in our soils over here. There's three forms of calcium. There's uh, agricultural lime, which is high calcium uh, product. You've got dolomite lime. That has calcium and magnesium in it. Uh, there are soils where you do need a little bit of magnesium. Down here on the floor, on the, on the valley floor, would benefit. I'm going to guess from some magnesium as well as calcium. And then the other form of calcium that's a little bit better for clay soils is um, calcium nitrate. Um, when you put calcium nitrate in water, or in the soil, it's going to dissolve into the calcium ion and the nitrate ion. The nitrate is to plants what glucose is to you. Um, glucose is what the cells of our body burn as fuel. So glucose is our energy. Um, problem is, in, this, this, in the store, most of the sugars in the store are glucose and fructose. When we combine that, it becomes common, what we commonly know as table sugar or sucrose. But when our body has glucose on board, it sees the fructose and says, we can't, we can't take that apart. We store the fructose for later. When the glucose is gone, then our body starts picking on the fructose. Um, the problem, though, is we everything's got high fructose corn syrup. We've, we've loaded our diets with fructose, and if there's a bit of glucose in our system, all that fructose gets stored. Now, it's a brilliant thing that God did that He put in a piece of fruit, glucose and fructose, because when we eat the fruit, and it's not outrageous and imbalanced with the whole glucose fructose thing, we get the immediate energy from the glucose. The fructose just sits around, and that's giving us energy a little bit later. And then, if we were to carry this analogy a little bit further, the starches, the potato. The starch is a long chain of glucose molecules. And it takes many hours for our body to take, you know, metal cutting scissors and cut that chain, all the bits and pieces, into the, I'm exaggerating. Uh, I hope you understand. But the body takes time for it to cut all of those little glucose molecules apart to be fuel for our body. So when we eat a potato, it's not going to give us instant energy. But three, four hours from now, our body has been able to pull those starches apart into the glucose molecules that our body can then eat. So, so it is brilliant the way God did things so that we have time release energy. Problem is, man comes along the messes it all up and, and overdoes it to the point that you know our, our food makes us fat. Uh, 
Um, so, where was that? I thought that was So, so the the nitrate, uh, the nitrogen up here in primary nutrients, this nitrogen right here, there's three forms of nitrogen that we often find in the soil. One of them is urea nitrogen. Anybody know the second one? Uh, oh. Ammonia nitrogen. And then <coughs> nitrate nitrogen. Ammonia, I, I don't know the formula for the urea, but the ammonia nitrogen is a nitrogen bonded to hydrogens. That's the ammonia. And the nitrate nitrogen is bonded to let me be conventional here. Uh, oxygen. This form of nitrogen, the nitrate, is available immediately for the plant to pick up. It's soluble. The ammonia nitrogen has to be bacterially converted from ammonia nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen before the plant can use it. And the same with the urea. When you, when you dump cow manure on the, uh, on the soil, it's got ammonia nitrogen, but it has a lot of urea nitrogen. The urea is converted to ammonia, which is then converted to the nitrate, and then that's what's available for the plant to take up and use. In the How does it convert? Bacteria. Bacteria. Yeah. Uh, so, let's make a little bit more of a jump. What's the difference between dirt and soil? Spelled different. Dirt is some of the shoes. Dirt is what you track in the house. Yeah, dirt is what you track in the house. Soil is what you plant. They're both four letter words. So there is a bit of difference here. Uh, especially in my industry, in the greenhouse industry, dirt is the step out there. Soil is what's in here. So in, in the greenhouse industry, that's conventionally how we. Uh, Define the two. This is soil. That's the about there. Dirt would have to be amended to be soil. <coughs> so, so dirt, the stuff out there, is actually that's God's product out there, mm -hmm. and it tends to be more complete than this. All this is right here, white bread. Manufactured. Mm -hmm. Most of it is uh, peat moss and pumice and a little bit of hopefully composted fur bark. That's your basic ingredients of potting soil. So it's and, only temporary, right? And it's all it is, is a holding medium for your plant. You have to add nutrients, you have to feed the plant that you put in this kind of stuff. So you're saying dirt's better? Yes, way better. So how come we don't use dirt to do this? Well, it would do that, but this thing would weigh 25 pounds. And then shipping a semi-load of plants from a you know, commercial greenhouse, it would be just like thousands of pounds more, and then you'd be... Imagine a hanging basket of dirt. It weighs about seven times more than the, the same amount of that soil. So it's a convenience thing, and you know, just like everything else mankind does, is they completely ruin it. Um, it's convenient for us, but it's it's not best for the plant. It's a desert for plants. That's how we have to feed stuff. Well, there is a fertilizer charge put into this that will last a few weeks, maybe a month. But after that, that fertilizer charge is going to be dissipated and uh, go away, and the plants are going to have to be fed. And every once in a while, I can see in this tray, there's a little fleck of blue, like right there. And when I squeeze it, it it's a little powdered blue blob of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. It was fertilizer in the soil. And it tastes salty. Oh. If we 
Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that's my left. Yeah. So, uh, the three different kind of lines have different applications. Uh, if you need calcium and magnesium, dolomite is the way to go. That's the, the one most common. Um, if you're down in Oregon, maybe around oh, west of Portland, kind of over towards Yamco in that area, they do a lot of grass seed production. And you might see this time of year, the, sea, the field looks like it's been snowed on. And what they put on it is agricultural lime. They lime that field. What it does is it brings the pH a little bit up and just makes it really good for the grass. So they're adjusting that, the chemistry, the soil chemistry, with agricultural lime. Uh, if, if you only want the calcium, in more of an acidic form, you can use this rather than the lime. Anyway, there's some differences there. I don't want to get too deep into that. But. Questions? How does this apply, the, the calcium? Uh, granular. This, this calcium nitrate is actually, that will dissolve in water, so that can be dissolved in water and water on. But typically, all of these are, are a fine granular, kind of like a sand product that you would weigh out the amount that you want and then just lightly sprinkle it over until equally you know, used it up. Do you put it right on the plant or around the... So established plants, you would use, you want to put it evenly because it's not going to... This might burn the plant if you put calcium nitrate right on the plant. Okay. It might burn it, so you would put it around the edge of the plant, but all... The rest of these, it's not going to okay. harm the plant. It's actually all good. Um, so when you're thinking about, let's back up here, creating a soil. Developing a grow bed or your garden soil, you want to up that uh, organic matter a bit. So, if, for instance, we're putting together a uh, grow bed soil or garden soil without the sides, I mean, what's the difference between? Uh, Developing garden soil versus grow beds. Well, one has sides on it, the other doesn't. Uh, what we want to go for is about 50% good topsoil. You can buy topsoil. There's many different places around town that uh, will have topsoil. And you want to ask some questions. Good quality topsoil, you want to know where it's from. Oftentimes, when they make topsoil, for instance, um, there was a place down in Battleground that I was asking about topsoil, and they told me it was made from, how did they say this? They made it from soil in a, uh, from a golf course. And if you know anything about golf courses, they put an enormous load of chemicals, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides yep. for golf courses to maintain that perfect grass. Right. Yeah, That's all chemistry that does that. And then they turn around and they make topsoil out of that. Uh, oh no. Top what? Topsoil. It's a top what? Uh. It's, it's polluted. So it's okay if you want it for your lawn, but not a garden. Right. Right. Um, Don't need it. So then the other variety of topsoil they had, they, they stopped making it because it was full of weeds. <laughs> um, 
So, so really kind of ask, so where does your topsoil come from? What, what's in it? Uh, how much do you sell? In, if they don't sell very much, there's going to be a reason why. Because people are buying, taking it home, and it's like, forget this. Um, so kind of ask about that. Do you have any recommendation for the four corners topsoil? Um, the four corner stuff is usually pretty good. Uh, I've used that a fair amount. I think it's okay. Um, the quality. Uh, uh, about 30% organic matter. And there's a difference in organic matter. There's green and there's brown. The green or organic matter tends to have more nitrogen. The brown organic matter, the dead leaves, so like green organic matter, lawn clippings, I think. Yeah, grass. Mm -hmm. Brown. Dry leaves. Dry leaves. Dry leaves mm -hmm. has more carbon. Mm -hmm. um, having I can't remember what the correct ratio is between nitrogen and carbon, but you want both the greens and the browns, organic matter. So what does that break us up to 50, 60, 70, 80 percent? Because of the, they ate the hay and the seeds were still in it? They were out eating, not necessarily the hay, but out there you know, eating all the weeds and okay. stuff. Um, had seeds. So chicken would be better? So chicken manure is usually pretty high in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And then also, to get enough of it, you're usually having to get it from a commercial mm -hmm. grower. And then you've got to ask yourself, what are they feeding the chickens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff that's not food, yeah. even for chickens. So, so it, it's problematic with the manures. Antibiotics. I know somebody that got some horse manure the other day. It was aged for almost close to three years. Mm -hmm. And what they fed the two horses and the pony, uh, they gave them nothing that had anything to do with any kind of sterilization or anything that would affect the manure. Yeah. So it was, it was good stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's nice, you know, especially its age is broken down, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost soil in and of right. itself at that point. But that's hard to find. It is. So be kind of particular about your your ingredients 
that you're looking for. Uh, Rob, when it comes to soil testing, Rob, yes. What about mink manure? Is that a problem too? Mink. Yeah, some people use mink manure on their oh. garden. How do you get that? From the mink farm. Mink farm. Mink farm. Oh. I know some people will use manure that comes from, oh, uh, you know, the llamas or that type of thing. Yeah. And they, some of them seem to have less trouble with. It. But I don't know anybody around here that's dealing with a lot with that. Do we have mink around here? Are going to be better off getting it from a clean versus unclean animal? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The diet of the mink is not. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are they feeding the main point? I mean, it's meat, I'm sure. Yeah. It's probably some uh, meat byproduct dog food type thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and it contains the same amount of antibiotics and other chemicals to try yeah. to keep them healthy. So, yeah, so it's probably best. You know, if, if you are exploring the newer option is to get it from a clean animal. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as soil testing, um, there's a huge range of, of testing that you can do. You can go down to Home Depot and you can buy this little tiny kit um, that's fairly inexpensive and it tests pH and nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Uh, so four things. That will give you a better idea of what's going on in your garden soil than not doing anything at all. But it's a baby step. Okay? For some of you who aren't big gardeners or you just want to do a little bit, do baby steps. Keep the training wheels on and get the little cheap kit just so that you can Play with it, it's easy to do, easy to follow one, two, three instructions, and, and see what it gives you. And then maybe next season, you want to do a little bit more, get the bigger kit. Uh, at some point, there are labs that you can send soil samples to. Back east, there's some really good labs, and I'm sure there's some labs out here in the west, but they will give you a huge profile of just about everything in that soil. Uh, not just the mineral content, but the pH, the cation, uh, cation exchange capacity, and, and these other features that are happening in the soil, they'll give you numbers for. And um, they can also tell you from your soil that will give you an, an analysis that will tell you, okay, put on this much, line this much and, the, and you, some labs will do conventional fertilizers uh, commercial stuff or they will give you the organic equivalent to that if you want to go organic uh, ultimately start easy so it's easy and it's doable and it's not a threat to you but then remember we're doing this for us for more you know, aesthetic and philosophical reasons and, and the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Keep educating your mind so that eventually you get to the point where you're not threatened by sending that soil away three states away and, and get this big data package that's going to give you the numbers that you can really get in and amend that soil and make it near perfect. You know, get yourself to that point where you understand that and what's going into it. And, uh, And what you get out of your soil is going to be way better. But, you know, take it a piece at a time so it, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, uh, let's, let's go on to some different ideas. And again, this, this thing of if you're not a big gardener, but you kind of want to get your fingers into it a little bit, start off with container gardening. Um, make it easy. You don't have to big plot out in the ground and have it all tilled up and all this work what do I do now? Just get some pots and start growing stuff. You can grow a pepper in a one gallon pot and it will produce a couple of peppers on it. It does. I have, matter of fact, I 
have a picture up there, I mean, some of you saw it. Um, a pepper in a, where are we here? In four inch, a four inch pot. So, so what happened here is, this was a flat of a four inch pot of uh, a bell pepper that didn't get sold, and so I just left it, the, and they stopped watering it. Well, what happened was, one of those plants, well, all the other plants were content to just sit in that pot and be fed and watered. The one plant was sticking its roots down out of the pot into the soil underneath, and it was tapped into the ground underneath that weed barrier. Um, this is in my greenhouse. The weed barrier actually has an inch and a half of sand, and then below the inch and a half of sand, it's got about three or four inches of gravel, and then the actual dirt is down below that gravel. And so that one plant has tapped into that. When I stopped watering, and guess what happened? Everybody died except the one with the deep roots. Now there's an object lesson here. <laughs> yes. What is it? There's 17 pew warmers there. They were just content to sit in the pew, uh, feed me, feed me. But there was one that went and got the relationship on its own. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was putting its root down deep. And when the blight and the drought came, it was ready. And not only did it not die, but what did it do? It fruited. It fruited. In a four inch pot. So peppers really don't need that much. I mean, they're not going to get as big as what could in the ground, but, but in a pot like this, you could get, you know, a couple of peppers. Tomatoes, you want a, a pot more of the size of, you know, a five gallon bucket. Um, again, you're, you're not going to do as good as if your tomato plants were in good ground, where the roots have just unfettered access to go wherever they want. Um, but again, start easy. Have the kids, container garden. Um, there are things that grow really well in containers. Uh, lettuce grows good in containers. Cherry tomatoes grow really well in containers. A five gallon bucket and a, toma a cherry tomato um, we'll give you plenty of other tomatoes. Like I said, peppers. If you want to try easy steps in the ground, just a little garden spot, maybe the size of this table. Um, easy step to grow radishes. You know, how long does it take to grow some short season radishes? 30 days. Well, something like 28. Like three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very easy to do. Quick, they come up, and especially in the cool part of the year, like now. Corn is very easy to grow. Uh, zucchini. Come on, you know. Zucchini. How many plants does it take to feed six people? Yeah. How, many, how many zucchini plants does it take to feed a whole crowd? One. One. <laughs> yeah, you go out and pick it every 20 minutes. And <laughs> Squash is pretty easy. Beans, uh, whole beans, or, or bush beans are fairly easy to grow. Start off with some of these easy things, and when you start off with the idea of gardening, you know, start with a few pots. Just make it easy so it's fun. Don't let the work sneak up on you so that it becomes uh, a drudgery. But just make it fun. Get comfortable with that, and then then take the next step. I do a little garden in the ground, a little bit bigger than my pots. And then I'm going to go a little bit bigger. And then I'm going to kind of work towards, instead of just easy stuff, then I'm going to go out and pick and eat. That's kind of the romantic garden, is the pick and eat garden. We want to take ourselves back to the agrarian, American, well, go back to that, the, the biblical agrarian, which lives on what they produce. Because at some point in time, we just might very well have to do that. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
Most of, some of you, how many of you remember the Second World War? Remember hearing about it. Do you realize it? what we have lost in that statement alone? Yes. Again. How many of you remember talking to your parents about the, the availability of food yeah. during the Second World War? Yeah. Yeah. I do. My mother would talk about the availability of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> My mom was born in the year of the Great Depression, 1929. And, you know, when I can get her in a lucid moment where she can remember stuff, times were different. And we have come to assume, and you all know what that means, um, that our food is always going to be available. We're always going to have money to buy it. Not so. And, and the majority of Earth's history, that is a luxury that that history just hasn't afforded but very, very few. You know, it's interesting, uh, during World War II, because of the victory gardens that people were growing, they, they petitioned Congress to get us daylight savings time. Oh, that's and after World War II, I forget how many years it took for the agricultural community to catch up with the need yeah. for fresh produce. It was three or four years. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and so now we're at the other end of that whole thing, and everybody's saying, "Why do we need daylight savings time?" And and so that's being has been entertained the last I don't know number of years to just get rid of it because we're not an agrarian. A hundred years ago. So if you were to make a bar graph, the population of the United States. In 1800, this many of the population was involved in agrarian mm -hmm. product production. Mm -hmm. Today, same line, that many are involved in agrarian production. Wow. We are messed up. As well, well, especially if you have to go to the market and it's not there. Yeah. Um, we're just you have to know who's got it. So this is a big thing that we want to talk about. Um, and we're not telling. Yeah. <laughs> who's got okay. some yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something I want to, when it comes to container guarding, and I want to throw this up to you. Uh, because this is an important little part to think about. The term Determinant versus in the term. Got about 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm hungry. Bush. <laughs> I don't eat till 2. I can't spell standing up. Bush versus climbing or I mean climbing. That. So, Determinant versus indeterminate. We use this in relationship to tomatoes. Um, determinant tomatoes will only grow so tall. They will stop growing, and they tend to put most of their fruit on in a short season of time, more or less, kind of all together. And then once you pick it, it's done. The indeterminate tomatoes are the ones that just keep growing and growing and growing and growing all season long until the frost kills them. And the indeterminate will put on a little bit of fruit as it grows, a little bit more, a little bit more, and you will get fruit over the whole summer, but just a little bit at a time. Now what's the advantage of one or the other? <laughs> so, on tomatoes, if you're, if you're canning connect tomatoes, you don't want to have to go out there every week and pick a bowl full of tomatoes and can two pints a week. Well, maybe you do, because sometimes that is convenient. But, but like the Roma tomatoes, the standard canners, Roma's, Amish paste, San Marzano's, 
there's another well-known one I can't think of, but these are all good paste tomatoes. They're Romas are determined. The bush will only get like this tall, and it'll put on like a hundred of tomatoes. You pick them almost all off in a short season. You get them all off. You you do all your preservation. You do all your canning, and and that's where determinants come in handy. A lot more food, less time frame. So if if you're if you're processing. You want to go out there, you want to get it all off, either this week or next week. It's all done, it's canned, it's preserved, it's put away. Whereas if you want fresh eating, um, almost all of the cherry tomatoes are indeterminate. And they just give you cherry tomatoes all summer long. And that's handy, that's nice. So the determinants, they actually do a little bit better in your pot. So if you want well, it's, it's a, I guess that's a top up because cherry tomatoes do nice in pots too and you pick them all season. But if you don't want a tomato, let's say, in a container garden, a pot, it's going to go absolutely crazy. You get what I'm saying? If you want more of a tiny plant in your tiny container garden, then pick a determinant. And they will all say in the catalog, determinant, indeterminate. Uh, you get the same thing with some other vegetables like beans or cucumbers. You can have bush beans, bush cucumbers. Again, if you're doing a container garden, you want this nice, tidy thing. You don't have a space for something to go eight feet everywhere. You get a bush variety. It's small, it's tidy, it's compact. It's going to be like that big. And it's going to, you know, produce you a nice crop, not over a huge season, the season window is going to be smaller. Uh, or if you've got the room, the space, and you want to be picking cucumbers or beans all, you know, half the summer, then get the climbing variety. Uh, those are going to go eight, ten feet tall. So train them on a fence or a trellis, and you go out there and get the uh, nice things go on. So that's kind of something to keep in mind is. What do you want to do with this stuff? Uh, and that kind of brings us to another uh, uh, point, and that is once you've got your fingers into this, once you have moved into the gardening, you're okay with the, uh, the containers, you started a little tiny plot, you grew stuff, and, and you've done the romantic garden, and by that I mean Almost, you, as you drive through and you watch people and you see their gardens, it really is romantic growing. Because what you put into that spot is way more money and time as it takes to just go buy it at the grocery store. <laughs> okay, think about this. Um, it makes my wife so happy to see it growing. Yes. That's right. But, I can go buy this exact thing, the exact amount, for so much cheaper than it cost me in time and money to produce it. So why on earth do I produce it? And we want to go back to the philosophy. Someday, it's not going to be there on the grocery store. Short, I want to know how to do it, I want to know how to do it well, and the, and the mechanics, the strategy, and the philosophy that it takes to grow, and I want to understand chemistry and the soil, that to produce it myself, Right? So I am going to spend the extra time and money to do this. Um, so we want to work towards that end. So rather than, let's not stop at the romantic garden, which is the nice step that we go out and we pick and we take to the table and we eat it and we feel good about ourselves. <laughs> what we're doing is we want to work ourselves towards a garden that gives us that kind of stuff that we've got to eat. But we want to produce stuff that we can preserve, that will supply us food in the dead of winter. That's what you're working. That's your end goal. Keep that as your end goal. So um, the squashes, like I said, these are nine months old, and they're still out of food, right? Um, we planted these carrots at the same time, probably. 
you know, last summer sometime. And this is still good food. Uh, potato is still good food. It's sprouting, but if I needed to, and things absolutely freaked out in town, I could still eat this. Right? And matter of fact, if it had bigger sprouts on it, think about this. If times were crazy enough that I had to dig up my potato plants, I could pull these shoots off, plant them, and they would produce potatoes, and I could eat them. Or at least peel them and peel the sprouts off and yes. plant those. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So, uh, necessity is another dimension. Uh, or, you know, I can can uh, beans and pickles, whatever. But the whole preservation thing is something different, although, uh, when the the primary foods to think about when it comes to this long-term food supply uh, winter squash potatoes um, beans, you can dry them and they last forever. Corn. Corn. Now, right there, beans, corn, potatoes, winter squash, you've got your complete food nutrition almost. There's one thing you're. Potatoes is almost a complete food by itself. Mm -hmm. If you do potatoes, And some form of green, you can almost live indefinitely of those two. A green of some sort, mixed green, green bag, and potatoes. Are beets difficult to grow? Not really. No. Um, beets are good for you too. And asparagus just keeps coming up and coming up. Just it does. Asparagus, you've got to have a fairly big plot to actually give you some enough to you know, can, but if you just want like a little meal here and there, the romantic garden, then you can grow a bin of Nettle, spiders. nettle, nettle. Oh, you're talking about wild nettles. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's about another that. class. So, yeah, yeah, that's another class, yeah. But these, just these four They're right here, right another one, actually, you could throw in. Um, Potatoes and nettle greens. Carrots. And lettuce, lettuce, harsh, harsh, mm -hmm. harsh. Uh, lettuce. There's no heat in that. Harsh. Oh, well. oh, beans. Um, Doing your sprouts for your greens. Oh, oh, I was good. I forgot to mention that the the ultimate container gardening is sprouting, right? That's gardening as well as anything else, just without the, all the soil stuff. Um, and sprouts have an enormously high nutritional value. Mm -hmm. Right? Put them to sprout. The other thing, too, to look up on the web is um, it's not called sprouting. What is it called? Um, Micro. Germany. Micro um, they, they've yeah. got a lot of resource over in Japan and Asia. In that area, the, the food value, the nutritional food value when you Okay, I'm going to use the word sprout, but you're not sprouting. When you, when you soak your rice, brown rice for instance, in warm water for, what did they say, 12 to 24 hours, you completely change the, the, the metabolism of what's happening in there and the nutrient value of that rice. When you've warmed it up and you've begun the germination process, the nutrition goes from, like, on a graph, Regular brown rice. Wow. To that when you when you sprout it. it it's not gonna look like a sprout, but just soaking it in warm and initiating the the, the metabolic you know what they call that? that sprouted sprouted. Is so, it what is that called or sprouted? Or? It's called sprouted. Is it? Yes. Yeah, there's I there's bought some at the health food store and it called it. Brown and brown rice. Sprout. You can only sprout brown rice. You can't sprout yeah, yeah. white rice. Right? But um, it has no sprouts on it. Yes, yes. Um, 
but it just changes. Like and one gal know. said that she sprouts all of her beans the same way. So yeah. it's them 24 hours. Yes. And that the nutrients. So I, I, I ferment or sprout yeah. the grain from my animals, yeah. which increases the, the value and, and gives them also a lot of money. Isn't that crazy? We, we do things for our animals that we don't even do for ourselves. <laughs> 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 like, wow. um, so, uh, but I want to come back to this. Okay. I don't want to lose it. Um, winter squash and potatoes. This is really important. Because um, I learned this the hard way. We grew a whole bunch of winter squash, we grew potatoes, and this was years ago. And I would have to go every week and go through the box of like potatoes and squash and pick out the rotten ones. And it's like, you know what? I'm picking more rotten ones out than I am picking ones out to take in and eat. What's going on? Well, winter squash and potatoes, you need to cure them. And then they do this. They keep for 13 months. Like I did that one banana squash. What does it take to cure them? Potatoes and winter squash, same thing. Uh, what we do is we will bring We'll leave these winter squash and actually the potatoes out in the garden until the vines are so withered, brown, decayed, or frost killed that you can obviously tell that vine is not contributing to the fruit anymore. It's, it's dead, essentially. Even if it is a little bit green, then you can tell it's done. So leave the stem on the squash, cut it. Or, or very carefully hold this down and break the vine off. The stem has got to stay on. And then what we do is we bring all of it in and we put it in our fireplace room where it's going to be 70, 75 degrees. And we will keep it in for about two weeks. Same with our potatoes. We'll put them in a loose bed and we'll crisscross them or stack them in such a way that it's, it's loose and it's out to the air. And it can dry down and get very, very dry. And that establishes the skin on these things. Uh, so, so you want that skin to dry down for several weeks. And then, these uh, squashes have been in our back bedroom where it's cool and dry since September. Now, I do have two other pumpkins that are starting to get like a little tiny bad spot on them. So we need to use those up real quick. Um, but the whole rest of it is still good. So, so the potatoes and the winter squash, cure them and they will last. If you keep them cool and dry, they'll last all winter. And that's what you want. You don't want necessarily food only in the summer when food's everywhere. You want food when there's no food available. <clears throat> the beans and the corn, you can dry those or you can can those. Either way. The carrots and the parsnips, and actually the carrots, parsnips, or the potatoes, you can actually leave in the ground. And matter of fact, especially parsnips, they're no good until they've frozen. Or at least the ground on top has frozen. And then the parsnips get really super sweet. And that's when it's really fun, when the whole landscape is dead and dormant, and there might be snow on the ground, it's raining, it's miserable, and you put your boots on it and you clomp out into the garden where apparently nothing is out there. Except the kale. Except the kale. <laughs> <laughs> we still have kale. Yeah. And if you know where the, the parsnips are, you dig them up. They're, they're hard, they're firm, just like these carrots. You take them in, you clean them off, and you have fresh garden produce right out of the garden, mid-December, mid-January, and it just feels like, now I am a garden. This is so <laughs> cool. I ate fresh stuff today, and it's mid-January. Um, carrots will do that too. They'll sweeten up once they get cold, they get a frost. So that's, you know, you pick a carrot in August and September, it's like, yeah. Um, 
it, it takes cold to really bring out the flavor and the sugar. So, so, so work towards that goal is sustainable food that's going to keep you year round. Um, I don't want to miss one thing. Do you have a couple minutes to talk about tools? A couple minutes to talk about tools, yes. Um, there's something else that I mentioned too. Oh, uh, winter garden. So winter garden, what, is it, what does it take to grow stuff in the winter? Well, most things do not actually grow in the winter. They just kind of sit there. Yeah, dormant. Dormant, like that. So the idea is like uh, kale, spinach will actually grow during the winter. It's one of the few things. So you can plant that really late, but the, primarily when it comes to winter growing, um, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, plant those in July so that they're, they're in, they're up to size when the winter hits. And they're just going to kind of sit there. You know, the broccoli you're probably going to harvest, the cauliflower you're going to harvest in the fall, but the kale is just going to freeze frame and you can go out there all winter and pick it. I was talking to Rob a little bit earlier, but if you go to the, go to the website of the National Gardening Association, they can allow you to put in your zip code and they can give you both a spring and a fall gardening schedule. Nice. So that, that might be a little helpful for some of us. But it's the National so, Gardening Association. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, look that up. There's, there's lots of, there's a, a website, it used, to, it used to be anyway, rainyside.com, mm. specifically for us okay. Northwestern Mossback mm. people. Um, tools. Uh, I don't know. There are a couple of things. Get good quality tools. Well, that's a long time. And if you really want a good quality shovel, I don't know how many shovels I've been through, but Fisker makes this. And now, is that? This is. All metal. That is steel handle. It's a steel handle. It's not round. It's Fiberglass doesn't last very long. No. You can't leverage with This is the most awesome shovel. I mean, I could, I could like stick this in a vise and I can sit on it without breaking. I mean, this is profoundly strong. Have you tried that yet? I think not we need this to. particular oh. one, but I've been using Dina's. Uh, that's where I first realized and I saw it, that man, this thing's tough. It's indestructible. Just keep it clean. You know, don't just abuse it. But forty-four dollars down at Wilco. Well, well um, this will go through many of these standard $20 shovels. So that's something you pass on the frying pan. So, yeah, this is really, really a good um, tool. Action hose uh, are just a real handy device, especially if you keep them clean and keep them fairly sharp on the edges. What is that? Action hose. Action hose. An action hose. It's a weed cutter. <laughs> uh, a regular hoe. Most people do not know this. A regular hoe. Good old fashioned hoe. How many people hoe? Yeah? yeah? That's not how you use a hoe. Okay? The old timers. The guy showed me. And I'm like, come over we here. have lost so much. Come where I can see. So, uh, so a good hoe, sharpen it, just like you would a knife, and, and sharpens, you bevel it on this face here. Wanda, yeah. pull that chair in. And... Thank you. Thank you. Use the hoe like you use a broom. Use it like this. Okay, you do, you do an hour of this, what's going to happen? Your back's going to hurt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're beating the ground, right? and your back's going to be real sore. You do this, you see how the blade is parallel to the ground? Yeah. Now if you're sharp, you're just skimming right into the ground and you're just taking those feet right off at the root. No sore back, just straight upright. And it's a lot easier to do this than that. 
So practice. It feels weird to start because it's like you want to just Get the job done. <laughs> yeah, you want to bang things, but that's human nonsense coming out that we got to get rid of. It's just, but the guy that I learned this from is like, really? And so he's like, yes, do it. How old were you? Uh, early 20s. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, wow, it works. I didn't it's grow easy. up that And it's no effort, hardly at all, to use something like that. So, um, standard tools, garden rake. And then a lawn ring, this is a tiny one because I didn't want to bring the big one, but you know the difference between a garden rake and a lawn ring. Sometimes you need this, sometimes you need one of these. Um, and then you got a cultivator. And then a cultivator that kind of gets in deeper. I don't use this a lot, but I, we do have these, we occasionally use these and a pitchfork in one ring. What did you call that what is this called? Cultivator. Cultivator. It gets down into the soil, so you're breaking up the top you know, inch or so. Ron, one of the places I find that the cultivator works well is if you're dealing with a lot of rock. Yeah, you can get and the, you can get around the rock, particularly if you want to get the rock out. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't hear this technique. Something else I want to <laughs> mention. Okay, we're talking about your If you really want to explore the year-round type garden, look up Elliot Coleman. Oh he's, got, he's got loads. really good stuff on year-round, especially winter gardening. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And you look at the pictures of this, of his greenhouse and what he does. And, it's like, and he's in Maine. I'm a retard. Um, he's in Maine? He's in Maine. Year-round gardening. Just unbelievable. Elliot Coleman. Elliot Coleman. Really, he oh, produces some good, good yeah. uh, material. Lots of YouTube stuff. Cole, see you Elliot. See you in the end. Uh, another good set, I mean, other than YouTube, I mean, there's anything you could possibly want on YouTube as far as container gardening, or this kind of gardening, that kind of um, Just spend an hour on YouTube and you can learn. <laughs> even more, but we have this DVD set, and it was produced by who? Misers. The Misers. What, what was their um, sustainable? Sustainable, sustainable preparedness. Preparedness.com? Yeah. That's part of that. Um, yeah, it's abbreviated, right? Mm -hmm. Suspect, what is, what is the website? Suspect.com. Abbreviated, sustainable preparedness. Okay. Suspect.com. Um, but this is a really nice set. You can buy, actually this set is a, is a compilation of seven other DVD sets. So it's all together. I, I thought it would be interesting to show the uh, EG Wright method of planting, but we're out of time. Um, that's in here. Uh, there's just a number of different things in here other than gardening. But uh, the uh, the Meister Sustainable Preparedness website produces a bunch of really nice videos on all things farming. Real nice uh, material to have, and then also the seed catalogs. If, if you want to go online and request seed catalogs. I mean, it's a little bit late this season, but uh, you know, there's a pretty good supply around town of seed. Uh, Fred Meyer. You know, actually, we do not have an official good-sized garden center in this. We used to. We used to have Greg's garden. And when they went away, we have the little castle rock nursery, but we really don't have, we have the big box people. But if uh, the next one south of us, Segawa Nursery, mm -hmm. lots of seed selection, real nice. And if you're in Portland, uh, Portland Nursery is on Division Street, right off 205. It has a lot of stuff, and it's a really fun place to go to. The gobs and gobs of seed selection. Yes? I found the, that Azure has a lot of variety. Right. So, plants and seeds, a yeah, lot of heirloom seeds, and I've ordered their plants two or three years they're now, nice and they are very nice. So plants. if you're tapped into Azure, you can get stuff from them as well. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, I pretty much talked about everything here. 
Um, any other questions? What's that thing laying against the wall? Oh, this. This. This is a seed plant. Uh, oh. So this is kind of a handy tool. Uh, Can't see it. So. So this is a seed planter. Typically, we've we've mostly used it to plant corn, but it's got these other seed wheels for little tiny seeds or or bean seeds, and it says right on it the seeds that uh, peas. Um, so this one, this wheel is for peas. This one, beans and small peas. Uh, versus this? Uh, more beans. Peas. Actually, those two are the same. Beets, Swiss chard, okra. Um, what is this one? Radish, asparagus, spinach, leek seeds. Little tiny. Um, but the one, the, the disc I have in there right now is for corn. You can plant a corn patch the size of this room. Ten minutes. Easy. Um, just fill this little hopper, and as you, if you look, as that front wheel moves, you see it's turning that wheel, and it's just picking up a little seed and dropping it down through the little chute into the ground. Um, this is making a little furrow in the ground, and the seed drops right down into that furrow. And it has something that closes it up, I think. Well, the chain is supposed to close oh. it up. I usually walk on the row behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can plant corn this fast. Wow. You know, then, that doesn't have a little marker on it, does it? And then I've got it all tied up, but you see this bar here with this, okay, that's this guy here? Mm -hmm. I don't really don't use it because I just eyeball everything. But this folds out. You can adjust this marker so that you can have it real close. So imagine this bar. Thank you. Is coming out here. You can adjust this marker to meet where the next row is going to be. So either you can be planting and you've done this part, you're going this way, and this little tab right here is putting a little line in the ground where your next row is. Mm. Or you can be doing it the other way around, and this is tracing over the top of your last row that you just did. So you can, you can have it set, so you're making a one foot spacing, and you're just going down the, and following the last row, or you're marking out the next row. And I mean, just planting corn, that's bad. So it's just really handy. Uh, I've not, Sure, how much they cost? You can get these in Johnny's, and you can probably get them locally. I can imagine. So, 135 on Amazon. 135? Okay. <laughs> Free shipping. This one. <laughs> this one is probably about 40 years old. Wow. So it's an investment. It lasts. And that that you have in your right hand flips around as a stand to stabilize the way you fill it. Yeah. So it's a kickstand. So it stays in theory. So, do you want? Can you touch on the triangles and the reme? Okay. So, good point. Um, this is a, a row cover. It's a very light uh, spun fabric that uh, several years ago, Jeannie and I planted a whole cold frame full of lettuce in November. Mm -hmm. The plant is about this big. And because it's lettuce, it won't grow in the cold. But we had it in a cold frame all in state, didn't move uh, all winter long. And when it got like below freezing, we would take this remake, we put the remake over the grow bed just as extra security, frost protection. Um, it was on for about a week during the, the worst of the weather. Took it off, and about now, so April, just 
just within a few weeks, that that lettuce just went, mm -hmm. and we had way more lettuce than we could possibly <laughs> use that year. So whether it's inside the greenhouse or outside the greenhouse, this just adds a degree of frost protection that uh, keeps things nice. I understand Elliot Coleman says that that will change your climate by one or two settings. I think it's one, one yeah. zone. It really does make a difference. Matter of fact, I've noticed a huge difference just putting some of this over the top of my uh, germinating box. Absolutely. I've noticed a difference. Inside the greenhouse. In, inside the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. It just saves on so much heat. Yeah. Just laying that across the top. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to, Jeannie wanted to mention was, uh, and I, we couldn't, I didn't find them, but get yourself some plastic, not plastic, uh, cardboard, and cut out of the cardboard three, six, nine, twelve, and I think eighteen. Triangles. And that's the length of these sides. Three inch, six inch, different side triangles. And if you're planting, Rather than in rows, but in a wide bed like this, um, you can take the triangle and lay it here, plant a seed at each corner, and then flip the triangle over, plant, flip it over, plant, plant. And when, with these triangles, whether you're doing seed or little seedlings, like we've done this a lot with the lettuce, you can evenly space out in a wide bed and they're all even, and so it's all going to come up nicely, and, and each plant's going to have its own little space. And depending on what you're planting, you're using the different size uh, triangles. Also nice for like beets, because they need room for the bulb. Yeah. Now, the spacing that you're talking about, the 3 inch, the 6 inch, the 9 inch, that's normally the spacing in the row that you would normally use that's on the seed pack, am I correct? You're using a block instead of rows. Correct. You're blocking them. Right, yeah, spacing right. Spacing between plants. Right. Now, that's normally the spacing that they give you in the row. But yeah. That's the spacing that you use yeah. for mm -hmm. block planting. There's right. There's no room to block in the middle of that. Right. The other side. Right? Instead, of do, yeah, instead of doing two little rows and then you're putting like a foot between each row, or each double rows, right. you are doing a block mm -hmm. of maybe two feet and it, you're almost, utilizing more of your space because you can easily reach over two feet right, or three feet. Right, that's almost like a raised bed with no sides. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. You're utilizing more of your space and having less walking, less you between the path. Yeah. Side. Well, and Elliot Coleman and, and, and Barbara Dosh get a lot into that. Yeah. So yeah, it's very good. So on these little three-inch ones, if you're doing like carrots or carrots or radishes or beets or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you could go on the three inch spacing, you could do a 12 inch row and have a dense planting. Or if you're doing broccoli, cabbage, you'd be using this big one mm -hmm. on like a 30 inch wide uh, bed. And it's just really handy, just flip it over, plant, flip, plant, flip, plant. And it's all spaced out nice, and it looks good. You know, in a row this It's this. uniform. Mm -hmm. It's uniform. And it's handy because it's just cardboard. Um, very good. Yeah. Do you soak your seeds before you plant them? Some of them. Which Corn, ones? Corn, beans. Peas. Peas. How long do you soak? Beets. Overnight. Do you soak beets? Not really. Uh, Not I haven't. Do we need to? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I've heard, it wouldn't hurt. I've heard it some hurt. people recommend it. Yeah. Okay. To kind of kick start it and get it going before it's actually mm -hmm. in. So. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. Yes. Unless there's something glaringly I missed. Some of you work here. Um, That's, that's my, uh, my germinating chamber.
And just what's there, there's one flap missing. But there is probably 4,000, almost 4,000 seedling. Or seed that hasn't come up yet in that amount of space. That's how come I'm using these tiny, tiny plug trays. Obviously, you guys aren't going to. Is that a 4 by 8? That's roughly 4 feet by 8 feet. Okay. Um, and I've, I've actually had this so full that I needed to put way more in there. So what I did was, I put two by sixes under these trays and ran two by sixes so I was growing. And I had them according, and then another one here, another one here. So you run vertically. So almost vertically, because I was I was doing a custom sew job for a farmer down in Woodland. Can you show that one more time? I Sorry. needed a lot of space. And so uh, I just took, it was either a two by six or a two by four, and I just brought these way up. So now, right there, these two flats are taking one flat's worth of space. Mm -hmm. So I could almost double. Yeah. Now it was kind of weird when the seeds came up, they were growing sideways. Yeah. But those are okay. They'll straighten out and fall themselves. They'll, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll fix themselves later. But um, so, you know, that's. That's funny. It's a nice problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, you know, like I said, you guys, you don't need this small of a cell. You can grow in this size or in this size and not be fine. Do you need to have a greenhouse? So, do you need to have a greenhouse? The, the greenhouse does several things. It either extends your season or enhances your growing environment. Okay, what do I mean by this? So we've got a greenhouse and we've got a coal frame. One is heated if we want it. The other one, the coal frame is unheated. The coal frame, during the growing season, that's summer, we plant our things in there that like extra heat. Eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, melons. And we'll do a greenhouse cucumber variety. It just likes it in there. As fall comes, and those things are done, those come out, we can put the fall crops in there. And that will take the, the weather inside that cold frame. How do I say this? The weather inside the cold frame in December and January is going to be like the weather in the regular outside garden in September, mm -hmm. October. So you kind of Fall in September and October clear into the end of January. And you can do that either on the end of the year or start in, like right now, in March or late February. You can start planting the cool weather of broccoli cabbage and then have those done and out by the time you're planting tomatoes. Um, so you can be gardening more. So, so there's several ways time. of doing this whole greenhouse thing. Um, and just let me mention this. Garden Supply Center, uh, uh, not just a garden supply, like a feed and grain place. You get hay, you get cow pasture stuff. Heavy 9 or 10 gauge wire, really heavy stuff. Comes in a roll about this big around. Mm -hmm. You can cut that roll in half, and you've got miniature greenhouse hoops that you can put this relay over and you get little row tunnels that are this wide and about that tall. Miniature greenhouse. You're talking about underneath your coal frame? You can go out of the garden or even in your coal frame and have a greenhouse inside of a greenhouse. The other thing that you can do if you want to go one step up is half inch PVC pipe comes in 10 foot lengths, cut the ends at an angle, jam this end in the ground, come over about 4 feet, jam the other end in the ground, now you've got a hoop that's about this wide and about that tall, and you can throw some plastic over it. You've made also a miniature greenhouse. Cheap ways to do things that it will extend your season. You can take that out and put it over established plants. 
that are already there. Or you can go one step up, and uh, just up the road, there's a guy, uh, his website is Steve's Greenhouses. He actually bends the metal piping to make small hobby greenhouses, 10 feet wide, 8 feet wide, and as long as you want, or small. Uh, Nathan's brother has one. I've got one. Yours? How big is yours? <laughs> I estimated 25 feet. A wide. Uh, I think it's 10. Ours is 16 by 48, right? Mm -hmm. Ours was 16 by 48. Yeah. Now it's 16 by about 60. Okay. We added 20 feet. Yeah. So yeah, he can bend those to whatever size is convenient for you. And you're just buying the ribs, really. So if you want it really long, you buy more ribs. If you want it short, you buy less ribs. And it's pretty economical. So then you have to close in both so, ends. So he can get you plastic, yeah, and you supply the ends, whatever you want to do for him. But having a greenhouse is just like one more really nice tool in your toolbox. Yeah. It's made it really nice for us. Yeah. So, they do that. Yeah, as long as you've got your plastic secured quite well. Just keep your cats on. Uh, yeah, don't let the cats climb. Yeah.